Welcome back, everybody, uh, to our Google Health Bioethics Summit. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the, the breakout sessions. I know I really had a fantastic conversation with our group and I think uh, identified some important questions for us to be thinking about moving forward. We're now going to uh, turn to our session on the uh, World Health Organization's WHO uh, guidelines for AI in healthcare. And I want to, first of all, remind everybody that this is the only session that we have during our uh, conference, which will be live streamed on uh, YouTube. So I just wanted to make people aware aware of that in advance. I also want to uh, welcome my uh, dear colleague, Dorothy uh, Caminetti, who is the Director of Bioethics at the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. And I'm going to turn it over to Dorothy, who will be the uh, moderator for this session with the WHO. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining this session focused on operationalizing the WHO guidelines for the ethics and governance of AI for health. In just a moment, I'll hand it over to Dr. Jeroen van den Oven, who is a professor of ethics and technology at Delft University of Technology. Professor van der Hoven was involved in drafting this guidance and will share a few words about it. After that, We'll hear reactions and thoughts on how organizations should try to oper operationalize these guidelines from a panel of four speakers. The speakers we've invited are experts in their fields and are here to speak from their experience. The views they express are their own and don't necessarily reflect those of Google. So please know that this session is being live streamed on, on YouTube Live, so we welcome viewers. If attendees who are on the call have questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat and we will try to get to as many as possible. So with no further ado, I'll pass the mic to Professor Van den Oven. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, yeah, I was asked by the, um, the ethics unit of the, the World Health Organization with whom I closely collaborated uh, together with uh, a number of other experts. I will show you their names uh, soon. Um, to uh, to give a short introduction uh, to the work that we've completed last year and that resulted in this report that I will 
try to give a, a short in, in, uh, overview over, uh, and it's impossible in this uh, in this short time to do justice to uh, to what has uh, has become a fairly comprehensive report, and I recommend that you all read it if you haven't already done so. Um, um, so I speak in that capacity as a, as a professor at Delft and as member, um, a former member of that of that uh, expert group. Um, I have to say it was a, a heartening and encouraging experience to sit around the table with so many experts from all over the world um, and to, uh, within a re reasonable time frame, to come up with, a, um, uh, with such a, a report. So I will give you a very short overview um, and then I will highlight towards the end something that I'm especially enthusiastic about that, that we, that we uh, collectively managed to embrace and advise to the rest for the, uh, of the world. And that, uh, that exactly plays to the, um, um, is relevant for the, uh, the subtitle, the title of this, uh, of this uh, section of your, of your event, which is the operationalization. And already uh, previous speakers I already heard uh, referring to this, this problem of the operationalization and making ethics and, and abstract principles work. Um, and I think that uh, we've managed to, uh, to make a, um, a step in the right direction. So next slide. So um, the report um, 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 kind of uh, maps out the opportunities and the ethical challenges. So both, you know, the, the positives and the negatives, they go hand in hand. Uh, we've arrived at a number of consensus principles with people from all over the world, including China, uh, the Global South, uh, Singapore. Um, and um, we describe a number of, uh, of interesting governance arrangements uh, for dealing with, uh, with artificial intelligence and the data that, that, uh, that go into it. We also arrive at a set of, of recommendations um, for all of the different uh, sections. And um, a thing that I'm also very uh, enthusiastic about is the checklists uh, and very special, specific uh, guidelines for uh, people in healthcare, for policymakers, designers, and and providers. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, yeah. So these are the people you see. There's a there's a wonderful spread of of, of the world, uh, Europe, but also um, Asia and, and Africa. Uh, so, next slide. And the things that I'm missing, uh, Rohit, my colleague uh, from uh, uh, the WHO, and Ken uh, from Miami, uh, was also a member of the of the committee. Can can add to. So we identified the following um, ethical challenges: uh, When should AI be used? Uh, AI and the um, the digital divide. Uh, data collection and use. It was also mentioned and discussed in the previous uh, uh, sections of your event. Accountability and responsibility for the use of AI, autonomous decision making, and what it does to human responsibility and the ability to take uh, responsibility both by um, receivers of care and the and the uh, and the medical uh, staff involved. Biases and discrimination, of course, a, um, a hugely uh, a widely discussed topic. Risks and safety and security, cybersecurity. Um, uh, artificial intelligence and sustainability issues, uh, impacts on uh, the labor market and employment in healthcare and medicine, and challenges in uh, commercialization uh, of AI in healthcare. Uh, so next slide. So these are the key uh, challenges, and um, hopefully these consensus principles that we arrive at uh, form an interesting uh, platform or vantage point to uh, to deal with those uh, those challenges. Um, protect autonomy, um, of course. Uh, a good number of these principles we uh, we uh, recognize from traditional uh, medical ethics, uh, Beecham and Childers principles, and and uh, what have you. Uh, promote human well-being, an obvious point, but uh, still very good to emphasize in this context of new technologies, digital technologies, human safety, and public interest. Uh, transparency, explainability, and intelligibility. Um, these are not, let's say, uh, values that are uh, valuable per se. Uh, for researchers, yes, interesting to, to be able to explain what you have found and what you're doing and what your models are doing. But they are there to serve primarily, uh, number four, responsibility and accountability. Without transparency, explainability and intelligibility, um, 
it will be very difficult for people, uh, the agents in the healthcare system using AI of some complexity to uh, take responsibility or to be held responsible and accountable. So that is a very important one. Um, ensure inclusiveness and equity um, and uh, promote AI that is, again, responsive and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, so these are uh, principles that we all agreed upon after two years of, of debate and discussion. So that is, uh, I think, uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, development to, to see. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have also um, charted and mapped the, um, the existing and, and possible governance uh, arrangements for AI, kind of looking at extant law, uh, and all kinds of experiments that are going on in, in soft law and self-regulation. And we identified those areas and, um, and uh, related them to the, the challenges and, on, on the other hand, the consensus principles in how far and, and seeing uh, in, to what extent those, those principles could be exemplified and expressed in those, in those governance arrangements. Uh, and then again, those recommendations for diff different uh, stakeholders that I will come back to at the end. So next slide, please. Um, so these are um, recommendations that are uh, very appropriate in this context, organized by, uh, by a lot of uh, uh, colleagues from Google, um, um, highlighting some of the, uh, the special um, recommendations for companies so that they, they must adhere to national and international uh, laws and regulations um, uh, when developing um, uh, their products and services uh, for commercial, partly for commercial purposes also. Um, and they should uh, invest in measures to improve the design oversight and reliability uh, and self-regulation of those products um, and uh, proportionate to the risks that are at stake. And of course, they need to uh, carefully look and, uh, uh, and volunteer research in assessing those risks. Um, companies and developers should conduct impact assessments um, uh, to, uh, to bring to the fore what the risks are, what the opportunities are, and, and how to balance them. Uh, and they should, of course, ensure the greatest possible transparency uh, of all their operations, their model verifications, their curation of the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, of course, coming from Europe, that is uh, is it's fairly obvious, but not in all parts of the world that is well recognised. Europe, of course, has built uh, a legal framework uh, where all of these things are uh, axiomata. Right? So that's uh, um, I can perhaps in the discussion come back to that how Europe uh, is is moving forward on the basis of its AI Act. Uh, comparable to your uh, bill that has uh, recently been been introduced on AI um, and the uh, the GDPR, and now it's moving into what is called a, um, uh, a European space for uh, healthcare data, and that's uh, that's the most recent plan that is on the table that is very pertinent to all the issues that you have been touching upon. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, yeah, again, considerations. Uh, the guidance document includes considerations with practical steps that, that, play, that, that speaks to the operationalization that you have uh, put, uh, given a central place here, um, and the checklist that I will come back to. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, what are the next steps uh, on part of the of the WHO and perhaps Rohit, my colleague from, from Geneva, uh, is, is a better uh, positioned to, uh, to talk to it. We are ourselves in, in Delft and in the Netherlands with uh, a couple of medical schools at Erasmus University in Leiden and Delft uh, involved in helping to spread the good news of this report and implement it into a, uh, a curriculum. So a global curriculum that will uh, bring people up to speed uh, about the findings and the results and the and the deliverables in the in the report. And I think that's hugely important because everyone needs to have the greatest possible awareness of the ethical issues uh, and um, and adjust uh, uh, their their practices and, and thinking accordingly. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, and then all stakeholders, including um, uh, companies and, and, and private uh, players in the in the in the in the private uh, sector, are accordingly invited to uh, to chip in and to contribute to codes of conduct that are in development that are based on our findings. Um, and as I said, the curriculum 
uh, that is uh, is now being being developed uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to do education. To so the WHO would welcome one or more roundtables with companies. Uh, so that's a standing invitation to all of you around the table uh, to organize and to uh, to get in touch with uh, WHO to see how we can um, uh, bring this uh, um, uh, forward. Uh, next slide, please. And so now I come to the part that is um, that is uh, it's clearly visible in the uh, and it's embraced by the WHO and I'm very very happy with that because it uh, it 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 accommodates a significant development in the ethics of technology uh, and it goes by the name of ethics by design. We'll say a little bit more about it because that is about the part that is about operationalization. So next slide, please. Um, and that starts with the idea that is, that um, designs and technology are not value neutral. That is stating the obvious, right? So we we have so many examples of that. How values and ideas and worldviews are and assumptions are baked into the software, the code, the at all levels of IT systems that that we work with. We um, we see that that values may creep into it, and therefore may affect the users, whether they are medical professionals or nurses or patients or decision makers, uh, their thinking and their uh, space of, of action is thereby affected. So designs are not value neutral. The flip side of that is that values are design consequential. If if Lisa or Dan uh, kind of is so big on privacy and talks about privacy a lot, then in, in thinking about a new hospital information system, we expect them to you know, refer to privacy very often and to look carefully at the specifications of uh, the new services and products uh, for uh, how privacy is dealt with. If that is not happening, then we can, you know, conclude that they were not that serious about privacy after all. So values are design consequential. They will show, reference to values will show up in your designs and your thinking about how the world should be changed. Um, so here the example is sustainability. Uh, you will see the signs that people are really thinking hard about how they could make the world a more sustainable place. And the same applies to transparency, accountability, privacy in the space of data and, uh, and AI. Next slide, please. So that is exactly the turn that ethics, applied ethics in medicine, but also in other fields, uh, in journalism, in library science, in uh, criminal justice uh, has made. Uh, and in digital ethics, of course, it is a design turn. Uh, so everyone thinks of, oh, no, oh we, we know Rawls' theory of distributive justice. We know all of these things. We can repeat them. We can kind of fine tune them. But now comes the time that we really have to think about um, how can we make this come true? Um, and that is, you know, you could call it a medical ethics 2.0. This is not, let's say, you know, the medical ethics as we've studied it and know it from our undergraduate uh, kind of uh, studies, but it is something that is, uh, that is appropriate and it is suitable for uh, the, the remainder of the 21st century. So it is crucially about digital innovations and design. Next slide, please. Uh, so the WHO um, is is uh, kind of on the basis of that report is doing these kind of detailed studies, and this is already moving in the direction of design. Uh, so um, the use of AI in pharmaceutical R and D, health financing, reproductive health, uh, these are things that are forthcoming and underway. Next slide, please. So this value um, and design, uh, so there are many groups, um, two of them here, uh, three of them here um, mentioned on this slide. Value-sensitive design is University of Washington. It's Bartja Friedman, a very good colleague with whom we are closely collaborating. Uh, value-sensitive design, uh, foregrounding design in order to, to make ethics um, kind of uh, come true in the real world of technology. Values in design, it's at the Cornell program of Helen Nissenbaum. Um, and uh, our programs in uh, in the Netherlands, designing for X or designing for values, the uh, IEEE has uh, has embraced these ideas as well, and um, kind of uh, expressed them in uh, very detailed and elaborate uh, attempts to come up with a systematic approach to software engineering, ethically aligned design, also geared towards uh, AI. Next slide, please. 
So this is how uh, this is our conceptual model, and there's a book uh, forthcoming. Everything you've always wanted to know about uh, design for values, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, so the, the left upper slide is about how you know we deal so on the basis of all of these values that are somehow can be kind of renamed as non-functional requirements. But they are so important that now, by now, we, we, are, we are starting to call them functional requirements, uh, although of a different sort. They are social, societal, legal, um, uh, or, and moral requirements. And they have to be expressed in the things that we make and design and, and implement. Uh, and then afterwards, we have to be able to uh, audit and, and justify these. Um, so that's the two yellow uh, circles, right? And so then we have to do what engineers would call. There were some engineers in the in the in the, in the audience uh, do a call a kind of functional decomposition of non-functional requirements. So we have to specify them in a way that it's tractable and demonstrable, and you can actually have a tractable and um, and good discussion about. Uh, how to, for example, if you do have privacy as, a, as your top level abstract value, then you break it down into until you hit the under the, the, the lowest layer, uh, which is just requirements and very detailed requirements that your that your IT uh, staff can work with. And you can follow the way back up again as well. If you inspect an object or inspect an artifact or a service or a product, you can say, what, what does it have this feature? Well, it has this feature and then you hit the middle layer and then you go up again. So you, that's exactly what, uh, what makes ethical debates in the context of high, high technology and AI tractable, we, we believe. Next slide, please. So uh, the WHO, these are quotes. Uh, I won't take you through them uh, kind of extensively, but uh, you know, design for values is the explicit transposition of moral and social values into context-dependent design requirements, a roadmap for stakeholders to translate human rights into context-dependent design requirements. And so that that is the uh, that's why I'm so enthusiastic here. Uh, will understand that that it's uh, that that is that's a step forward because we really need to provide our both our engineers and the people working in clinical medicine interested and working with AI to provide them with a conceptual framework that allows them to in a tractable demonstrable and transparent way to move from high abstract values that are uh, in those wonderful manifestos that we've seen so many of, to translate them into requirements in, in, in a way that is that that makes their their efforts justifiable. Next slide, please. So that is uh, what in uh, in a in a European language we would call responsible innovation with AI. That is, uh, do this, design for your values in an explicit and systematic way, in an agile way solve urgent and important problems for humanity demonstrably in this way do not create new problems do not exacerbate existing problems act in accordance with extant law and widely shared ethical principles while enhancing the conditions for human responsibility so autonomy free choice reflection knowledge and control um, so you want to increase the opportunities to be held responsible or for people to take responsibility and that comes with certain epistemic conditions that need to be fulfilled. And also these are objects of design efforts. You have to design uh, epistemic conditions that make it possible for all the agents in the healthcare domain and everywhere else for that matter, uh, to take responsibility and make it fair and reasonable to ascribe responsibility to them. Human warranty is very important, but again, human warranty uh, comes with certain epistemic conditions that need to be satisfied. Next slide, please. So, and this is the last part, and you know, this is becoming the re really practical, coming from a, an engineering university, I, I've managed to survive for 20 years among engineers. Uh, so I, I do this by uh, really taking their questions serious if they ask, what, what do I have to do uh, different on Monday morning? Uh, so that, that is a very important thing. So, um, so we've, we've specified as far as we could in this context, um, so designing for AIs, guide, get providing guidance design, clarify objectives, uh, engage multiple stakeholders. So we give very specific advice. Next slide, please. And also for development and deployment, same thing. Um, so that is why um, I'm very happy with, uh, with all, of, all of this. And uh, I hope uh, that um, it will be taken up and it will be mainstreamed because uh, I think it's, it's very necessary. Yeah, thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Van den Oven. So to share some reactions now, we welcome Wendell Wallace, a senior advisor at the Hastings Center and scholar at Yale University's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics. Well, thank you ever so much. I'm, I'm truly honored to be with you this evening or daytime, depending on what part of the world each of you is. I happen to be in Geneva at the moment. Um, as Jerome said, this is a remarkably comprehensive document, and I think that's both its strength and to some extent its weakness when you think about the oper op operationalization of the WHO recommendations. So we have gone from having these broad principles, and again, in this case, those principles were narrowed down to those most applicable to the healthcare industry. And this document goes into elucidation of the many ways, the many concerns that arise in healthcare when you consider those principles and in the different sectors and the different kinds of AI systems that we are introducing. It focused particularly on specific forms of application, but let's keep in mind, and maybe I'll use an example for what we're trying to keep in mind. Uh, think about automobiles just a mere 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, they did not have computer chips at all. Everybody could tinker around with their car. Nobody will do that anymore because there are so many chips in those cars, and we don't even think about them in most situations until our car breaks down, and then we want to we, of course, want to repair it and know what happened. And we're dealing with roughly the same thing with AI. Sometimes, and particularly in this early stage, we are talking specifically about AI applications for some particular end within healthcare. But the reality is AI is going to be an almost unnoticeable aspect of very complex systems that give different kinds of uh, output. They may not even be noticed until something goes wrong, or at least that it's brought to light that they are functioning in ways that are not appropriate to the situations at hand. So this is this very difficult aspect of AI that it's going to be ubiquitous, it's going to affect all areas of life, and therefore it shows up not only in the specific AI applications for healthcare, but in the complex social adaptive systems that healthcare is and may actually have AI systems showing up in ways that we are not even attending to. But this is a wonderfully comprehensive document. I think it will be um, revelatory for those who have not been in the ethics of AI over the last few years and have tended to think of AI ethics in terms of a few problems, and suddenly they're exposed to how these value considerations arise everywhere. But that's also what makes this very difficult, it's daunting. And particularly daunting when you think about operationalizing what's within these documents. And furthermore, there are all kinds of issues that arise sometimes with only a line or so within the document that someone on the ethics committee was aware of or the, or the uh, writing committee was aware of and they want to make sure it got in the document. But you think about even some of the littler aspects and they pose some rather serious considerations when you begin to think about how you might operationalize them. Again, there's not a lot that's operationalized here, but as Yaron pointed out, we are moving toward what will be necessary. I'm thrilled that he, um, he covered the aspect of ethics by design, something that he has really been one of the leaders in formulating. And of course, ethics by design isn't just for those who are engineering the systems themselves, but it's also in the deployment of the systems and how those systems may actually alter the very nature of care when they are introduced into a hospital or some other healthcare environment. Um, we have a colleague, um, Amy Van Winsberger, who uh, did a wonderful job of illustrating this in, uh, in, in her PhD thesis thesis when she pointed out of how just the introduction of a couple simple robots to do one task or another actually altered the very structure of care itself. So we aren't designing just to get ethics into the applications, but we're designing to be sure that the whole environment, which is altered by the introduction of these AI systems, 
does indeed reflect the values that we want to see in the care that we're putting forward. So the daunting aspect, I mean, the good news and perhaps partially why the document was designed as it was, is it wanted to play this down a little bit, didn't want to scare people off. But the reality is that not all applications are going to have to deal with all the different considerations. But the other reality is that many applications don't just have one or two of the considerations that were brought up in this document impinging upon their design or their application. And in some situations, we are getting competing values or competing considerations, and therefore you get into this kind of new approach to ethics, a kind of re-envisioning ethics, as I call it, where you have to work through what does, what does it mean when you don't simply have it a principle such as well, this system is biased or it is not biased by some clear criteria you've set for it yourself, but it actually has an array of ethical concerns that impinge upon them and their trade-offs between one course of action or another course of action. Again, there's not the time here, and I only have a few minutes, so we're not going to be able to go through individually the recommendations, but I do want to talk about one, which is the assessment of the systems. Uh, there are many dimensions to assessment. It's not just whether the systems are indeed effective or do what they say they do, and not just even the societal impacts. But as I alluded to earlier, there are these trade-offs. There are thinking about the different ways in which a system might be deployed, the different courses of action, the various values, the various goals the very, that might be realized, the various detriments that might real, be realized in the various courses of action. And not only that you pick the best course forward, but you also address the detriments that occur because you picked one course over another course in the way you deployed or implemented the system. But the biggest issue in operationalizing these principles is who does it? Who's going to do the, the assessment? Perhaps the industry is going to give you some benchmarks and academia will, will give you some benchmarks, but these are adaptive systems. These are sometimes learning systems that are changing themselves over time. So they have to be constantly reassessed. Their societal impacts may change as the context in which they're deployed is changed. So there is this real challenge in terms of how they're going to be assessed and how those assessments are going to be shared with the practitioners. Perhaps we can put in place some system of distributed assessments where different aspect of the assessment takes place within different within academia or by industry or by um, by bodies that want to be sure about the safety of the the systems. But then you still have the problem of how you're going to conglomerate all these dis assessments all, or all the different assessment information. And will this only happen in the high-income countries? What about the middle to low-income countries, as are constantly alluded to? They are unlikely to be in a position to do full assessments themselves and therefore either dependent on following suit with countries that may have very different goals than, than them or they need to turn to some other source. And that's why I, for example, have been advocating for many years that we need the international governance, governance of many facets of AI. Now, this is brought up and among the rec recommendations within the document, but to be sure, it's not gone into in any great detail. But I'd just like to focus on it in this one area, this area of assessment, because I think that might be the first goal that could be operationalized by some new international governance body, or perhaps it can be implemented through the UN or through IEEE or through, uh, or through the WHO, each of which has benefits and detriments as you think of them doing that. But for example, when a vaccine gets endorsed by the WHO, that has a great deal of power for some countries, for some users. It may not have a great deal of power from the perspective of the United States, 
because we're early adopters or by by Europe or by others that are in that early adoption camp. But it's certainly going to, for those countries, those entities that are not in the in their own position to do a full assessment. So my first recommendation is we set up an international body that does that, that uh, turns to the best of practices, that tries to give a pretty effective assessment, first of all, whether the system is effective, what its societal impacts might be, what the trade-offs might be. There's this constant hype about how good AI applications will be and how much they're going to improve healthcare. But is that really the case? for all of these applications. And might there all be secondary societal impacts that uh, make them undesirable? Uh, for example, think of the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. By some estimates, AI is going to help realize, oh, there's sort of about 200 different endpoints that have been selected within those 17 goals. By some estimates, AI can help achieve two-thirds of those, but it'll probably set back about a third of them. So it's really this question of trade-offs and getting off this bandwagon and hype that AI is good because it's AI. And the second part of this is that innovation is good because it's innovation. Particularly in the United States, we have a cult of innovation, and therefore we are super concerned for various political and economic reasons about interfering innovation. So this brings us to really the next, my next to last point, which is what's the power structures that we're dealing with here? And are those power structures really going to be helpful in operationalizing these goals? Uh, corporate self-government has a history of being abysmal. And even in this area where Let's say there are many of you who are within the ethics divisions of large corporations, and you're really sincerely working on those aspects. Your same corporations may also be engaged with governments in thwarting our ability to put in place serious regulations with teeth that hold back the corporations in the realization of their economic goals. But if the corporations are ready to put their money where their mouth is, and I would say an international body engaged in assessments would be a good place, well, an international body engaged in assessing every AI system that comes through is going to be awfully slow. Unless it can function at scale, and it can only function at scale where if it has adequate funding. So I would suggest that maybe some of the corporations should be funding such a body to ensure that the endorsements that they seek um, come through that international assessing body relatively quickly. So that's just an operationalizing suggestion. Now, let me just go to my final point, inclusivity. We talk about inclusivity these days till hell freezes over. But even in this document, Inclusivity is often the last of the list of recommendations in, the, in each of the groups of recommendations. And perhaps inclusivity now should become the first. That we stop talking about health care totally in terms of those of us who live on the privileged side of history, have easy access to vaccines and other forms of health care, and think in a Rawlsian sense that our healthcare is only as good as it is for the least among us. So I think we need to really put inclusivity in the forefront of our operationalizing these ethical principles. So far, we've been abysmal in that. Think about vaccine distribution. Most of us here have probably had all the vaccines we've wanted. I'm up to my fifth vaccine. But there are many people in the world who have not had their first. So again, that has to become one of our first concerns into truly operationalizing and including everyone and not thinking of these principles just in terms of the high income countries that are in a position to adopt or not adopt as they see fit or as political and power dimensions allow them. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Walash, for these insightful comments and suggestions. Uh, to share, um, so next up, we welcome Dr. Craig Klugman, Professor of Bioethics and Health Humanities at DePaul University. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I want to start by saying how um, impressive this WHO document is, how thoughtful it is, and how comprehensive it is, as you know, the first speaker said. When I was reading through it, I kept going back to what will be familiar with many people who have um, an experience in the tech world, which is Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. And even in the world of science fiction, before there were robots, it was the idea of how do we design these tools so that first and foremost, they protect us, that they do not cause harm to us. Of course, if you read later books, you see that can go awry. But it was the idea that the ethics should be at the basis of developing more advanced technologies. And so we need to ensure that AI works for us, not that we work for the AI. And this is important because if you talk to physicians who work on the clinical wards, some will say that they feel their job is populating the electronic medical record first and treating patients second. Some studies show that doctors spend as much time putting information into the record as they do treating patients. Some studies show they'd spend twice as much time feeding information into the system as they do with the patient. And this doesn't make for um, economic sense. It doesn't make for good healing sense or for good professional sense. In a sense, what we are dealing with here is a classic public health conflict, protecting individual human rights versus the needs and benefits of the society. And it's a conflict because the individual will benefit from this sharing because they are a member of society, even though they may not benefit from the particular sharing they're doing. This is the prevention paradox, right? You may not personally benefit, but you will benefit because at some point, all of society benefits from this. And as Dr. Wallach said, we need to focus on Rawls's idea of the maximum principle or standpoint theory that who benefits the, the most should be those who have the least. Right? So the greatest benefit should not come to the global north, should not come to people who have access to high intensity, high technology medical care, but should come to those who don't have access to those things. And that's where a, a good just prioritization should be. One of the things that came out of the conversations that we've had here earlier today and that really were pertinent to me in this paper were that we are talking about two different types of data. One is medical data, which are things from like the electronic medical record that come from the doctors, the hospitals, what we would call in the U.S. covered entities, right? And there are legal requirements that they must protect this data. They are fiduciaries. They have duties of confidentiality. The other type of data is what I'll call health data. And these are things like your wearables, your social media, self-reports. These are uncovered in terms of HIPAA and in terms of other legal frameworks. But they're both data that can give insight into who we are, into our health, and they're both valuable. And so I'm going to suggest that we shouldn't be treating these sources of data different. And I felt like the WHO report really focused on the medical data, but could put more emphasis on the health data. There is a, an idea here that uh, I think has been throughout this report and the conversation that the train is left the station and AIs are coming. Yeah, AIs are actually already here. But I also get the sense that the health AI may be a solution in search of a problem. Are we doing it simply because we can to prove that we can, or are we trying to real so solve real problems? For example, uh, a recent study came out this week. We know that for a decade now, we have been pushed to get colonoscopies every few years that these are going to save lives. And it turns out that, yes, colonoscopies do diagnose more cancers, but it's fairly limited effectiveness in saving lives. Brand new study that's out. And so we have to think about, are we actually solving real world problems? And we have to solve about who's identifying the problem. So if the problems are coming from companies that are creating these because they can, that's not necessarily solving the problems that people have in their communities and at home. And so we need to have a partnership here where 
we're doing community-based participatory research and we're getting the input of the local communities that they identify the problems. One area that I thought was not brought up in this guidance was sort of what I'll call the freedom from information. Say we have an AI that can predict disease before there are even noticeable symptoms. One of the famous examples is Target, which is a corporation starts sending out coupons to people um, for baby and pregnancy goods before that person is even aware of it. What if a person doesn't want to know? What if a person has no desire to know that they have a disease? Is there a way that you can be free from being informed by these? Are, are there guidelines that exist that say, which were in the WHO and are in the White House uh, guidelines as well, the Bill of Rights, that say you need to, be, you need to have your information? But maybe we should ask people if they want it. They don't always do. I also wondered if the public would have access to a health AI, to interact with it, to get information, to make inquiries. What comes across in these documents is the idea that the healthcare worker is the intermediary, that, that these are, AIs are decision aids and everything goes through the healthcare worker. But that is not necessarily the case. In fact, there's a contradiction here because if we're going to use this for telehealth, then we are automatically removing the healthcare worker from the environment and the relationship here. So are we just using the physicians as these intermediaries? I mean, how many patients today say, I don't have this disease, I do have this disease, I Googled it, or what we euphemistically call Dr. Google. So in the first, we, we are acting where patients will have direct access, but they may, they may not understand context or interpretation. In the second, the yeah, AI could remain a decision aid, but if a patient has a high level of health literacy, never mind education, they may be unnecessarily panicked by getting information directly from the AI without context or counseling. And I saw this uh, last year when I go in for my regular physical and I got a notice from my electronic health record that the data was in. And I looked at the data and they say, this is your, your numbers and these are like the average values. And there can be a moment of panic when you're near the, the one of the extremes of the average values or elsewhere. And yet my physician could explain it to me and the appointment wasn't for two more weeks saying, I'm not worried about any of this. The, there's interactions or what was going on at the time of day. Without that context, this could be panicking for people. We've learned, a lot of my experience has been in the area of public health, and I've worked on a lot of the COVID issues, both on state and national levels. And we've learned lessons from COVID and the electronic health record, right? There's a lack of interoperability. So if Google developed one and Apple develops one, we need to be sure that they can actually talk to one another. We know that different groups want different informations. In COVID, many healthcare workers spent hours filling out different forms with the same and different information for different entities. So the county wanted the paper on a report on uh, information on A. The state wanted an online form, which would ask A and B. The feds actually didn't have the power to ask anybody for anything. They were just waiting for people to actually give them information. But what they really wanted to know was C. And so we need to be sure that we are addressing all levels if we are going to have a system that isn't uh, that is beneficial to a large group of people. We also need to consider the human factors at all levels. So we need to have working groups that are having input in the creation and the design and the thinking about these doctors, nurses, patients, staff, health professionals. We need to have communities involved in defining what the problems are. We need to have companies working with communities to choose the best solutions. It may not be the high-tech solution that is what they want or need. They need to be involved in the development. When I was working with a company on a digital pill product, what we found was that in human factors testing, it didn't wasn't easy. The instructions that they had created were not easy to follow. And so what you end up is a situation where you spend a lot of money, you develop these products, and people don't use them, or they use them incorrectly, which leads to bad data, which can be a worse situation. I also think we need to have some sort of safety monitoring board. Is the AI doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it achieving the original aims? Is it making good recommendations? We do this for medical trainees. We don't let them just go on day one, start doing surgeries. They have to be trained and then they have to be supervised and they have to get feedback. And we need to make sure that there's a system that also does that for the AIs. And the last thing I wanted to bring up, which is just kind of a crazy out there idea was, there's been a lot 
I've talked about in this public health sphere of using AI to combat misinformation for medical purposes. But knowing that AIs also represent the bias of their programmers and the bias of their data sets, how do we prevent an AI from creating and spreading its own misinformation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kriegman. Um, I'll pass it off now to uh, Key Crechton Green, a senior advisor at the Hastings Center. Thank you. So we're going to pull together some things that were briefly touched on uh, with other speakers. Uh, our first speaker uh, referenced towards the end some like specific guidance for engineers. Uh, Wendell Wallach brought up the question of who does it, talking about assessments. Uh, and I want to answer that question that you will come up with a solution. Um, as I give you a deep dive in how can individual developers, researchers, and early stage companies come to understand and use this guidance. Um, so from whatever role you sit in, whatever organization and field that you're in, there may be a way that you can you know, help contribute to this happening. Uh, so I wanna talk about some of the challenges um, use for ethics principles that appear early in the guidance as a way to organize those challenges. Uh, talk about some of the solutions that have been tried, some of their pros and cons. Um, and then what can and should we or you do about it? And since principles beget principles, beget principles, uh, we'll have at the end, you know, some on this question specifically, how can we get individual developers um, and earlier stages of AI, um, how can we get this guidance in? You know, so what can we do? So I have worn many hats in my career um, to have insight into this question. I've been a machine learning engineer. I've been a partner at a law firm advising AI and robotics startups. Um, I've worked in big tech and advised government agencies and so it gives me different vantage points to say, how would you reach into that early stage for oper operationalizing? Uh, so let's talk about some of the challenges. The big one is incentives are not aligned, right? If I am a software developer, I've got goals and metrics to meet, and they're probably about growth, they're about speed, they're maybe about doing things more efficiently so we use fewer resources. Nothing about this. It's not because I'm a bad person and don't want everyone to have a good experience. I do. Like, I do want human rights to be advanced throughout the world. But first, it's probably not going to cross my mind that this is part of my job at all if it even crosses my mind that it's anyone's. Now there's more and more awareness. So maybe it will start to cross my mind, uh, but it will cost me a lot to do anything. So first there are the inefficiencies of if me and everyone like me as an engineer, we have to develop on our own, like we have to read this document, which was long, then we have to understand it. And then we have to think about like, what does this, that actually mean in our practice? Uh, so there, we need some clear, easy steps that I can take that I don't have to come up with by myself, but that I, I could have some input into if I want to. Um, so whether someone is in research at a university or at a company, uh, or if they're more a line engineer, um, think about what the incentives are. How many papers did I publish and where? You know, did I meet my team's goals for a launch on a certain day? Are there ways we can tie those existing incentives or create new ones um, that aren't just the stick of legislation? Um, because certainly compliance is a big stick. Um, you know, but there are other ways for me as an individual um, that you both make it less burdensome and make it like actively positive for the things I care about. And they aren't only those career metrics. Like personally, if I'm interested in it and I love problem solving, like that's a big carrot. 
So, you know, finding a way potentially to tap into what do people like to do? And if this matches that, but if it doesn't match that, maybe it's not the engineer that should do it. Maybe it's some other external support that they need where external could be within the company um, and it could be somewhere else. Um, so early in the document, there are four ethics principles, not the, the six we later get to just for health, but avoiding harm, promoting well-being, fairness, and autonomy. And it occurred to me that looking at an individual engineer, a lot of the challenges can be lumped into that, you know, they can be aligned into that framework. So in terms of avoiding harm, we have delay in project, working longer hours, opportunity cost, Fewer papers published, loss of status, prestige, not fitting in with the rest of my team, uh, doing work that is or feels meaningless or not valued. And I assume for most of my audience, you'll be like, wait, what? Not, not, not meaningful? Like, well, make me feel like it is. Maybe it's not that I don't think that advancing human rights is meaningful, but maybe I think the fact that you make me write a paragraph when I submit this research paper to the leading machine learning conference that explains, you know, what my research has to do with, you know, sort of societal issues, right? How could, you know, how does it fit into responsible AI? Is that a meaningful exercise or is it a check the box, make more work exercise? Um, so there's the loss of IP risk. Uh, the there's some disincentives I see for developers um, you know, reading through the guidance. So there's a proposal for liability or fault, which would sort of make a joint liability. Everyone involved, all the way up, is liable, and we're not even going to take into consideration anything not only about their intent but about their ability to have changed the outcome. Uh, at the point in my career where it, there was a point where it switched and I realized, oh, wait, for software engineering now, like I have to think about insurance, like malpractice insurance. And that's kind of scary. And malpractice insurance gets certain kinds of doctors to leave certain specialties and get certain kinds of, you know, certain medical students not to go into certain professions. I mean, specifically delivering babies is very risky and it creates a shortage. Promoting well-being in some ways very tied to the avoiding harm in this aligning incentives. You know, there is currently not a big reward for effort or outcome for individual engineers. Uh, fairness, I saw a number of things where, so especially in my practice as a law firm partner for tech startups, just the legal compliance alone, aside from looking more broadly at like, what do we think the right thing is? It's enormous. It is an enormous burden when you have a limited runway. It is impossible to very difficult. Like I would advise clients, if you have an even close business option in the US, do not go to Europe because of GDPR. Uh, so when we think about like that burden, how can we reduce it, especially for these early stage companies or individual developers and founders? Uh, and we talked about the, the liability. So there's also another big one. There's a lack of access. So this isn't maybe fairness to the developer, but there's a lot about how do we pull in civil society? How do we pull in the views of patients and doctors and those who are affected um, you know, in the design and development of AI. Well, okay, so I'm a founder or, okay, so I'm an individual developer. I don't have access. Um, I don't have access to the amount of money I would need to hi hire outside counsel to address all of the jurisdictions I would like to introduce my product to. And I don't have access to these other civil society groups. Uh, in a bigger company, I would, or part of the company would. Uh, so as we talk about solutions, 
I think that's a big one that we could think about. How do we solve the problem for the smaller entities that don't have the resources and the efficiency? Is there a way that we can make it easier and cheaper for for them to have the same access that within a big company, a big tech company can provide it for themselves, right? So there are enormous departments in the big tech companies that are looking at ethics and privacy and that convene groups of outside stakeholders under NDA to be able to have some of these conversations. Is there a way to create that for you know, these smaller groups and startups to be able to tap into so that it can be in their products early? Um, some are very interested in incorporating you know, thinking about ethics and thinking about responsible AI and doing the right thing. I had clients who were very enthusiastic. Uh, but how can we make it, you know, reduce those barriers to entry? So other smaller things are, you know, with technical journals. Um, one positive thing I saw with a, a friend who was on the technical side in help AI was once he went through a fellowship program at Harvard and MIT that was sort of a, a part-time thing during his career, he would always get called on in his research group to write the section of the paper that talked about responsible AI, which meant that he got on every paper. That actually gives him you know, technical papers that count very much towards you know, what he needs to do professionally uh, in, a, in a really positive way. So looking at what are the you know, high level, what can we do to make it so individual developers, make it easy, meet them where they are in their processes, short, memorable, maybe provide templates, examples of how this would really you know, apply in their work or something that they would recognize. Uh, operationalizable, so creating examples and you know, maybe some sort of process that really fits in. There's uh, references to toolkits in the guidance. Uh, so easy, operationalizable, providing expert and civil society access that individuals or early stage companies can access more cheaply, uh, find other ways to reduce barriers, to create rewards, um, and to provide autonomy uh, so that we don't, in legislation or in guidance, prescribe too much, like leave there to be room for the individuals to, to figure out the best solutions within, um, you know, sort of parameters. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. And now, last, last but not least, we have Dr. Ken Goodman, a fellow at the Hastings Center and founder and director of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine's Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy. Thank you so much, Dorothy. If I might begin, Lisa, with an emo moment, uh, what, what a cool project that you and Millie have pulled together. Uh, and uh, and a couple of other shout outs, in addition to your own, who, who did so much work on this. I, I don't know if he's still here, but Rohit Malpani, with the WHO, was among the, the real brains of the outfit. As you can imagine, I think if you count the number of people, hundreds worked on this report. Um, I had an idea, if we get a really, really big grant, let's get a bunch of people who did ethics and information technology, put them in locked rooms and say, identify core principles to guide such guidance. And I think we get different kinds of principles. Uh, they, they, at least they would be listed differently. It was an interesting project and it, and it and I think fulfills a number of obligations. Let me begin though with, with a, um, the, I, I've, I've gotten a sense over the years that this is a little bit like the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. You all know the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. That's where cowboy Bart walks up to the side of a barn, takes out his six shooter and shoots a hole in the side of the barn. And then he walks over and draws a bullseye around it. Um, we study what we can study and we worry about what we can worry about. One of the virtues of this session here is to be reminded of the fact that, that those of us who are wringing our hands over this are 
are privileged to be able to do so. You know, if, you, if you've got a problem, for example, with racism in your country, and you're worried about racism in the economy, yeah. law enforcement, the judiciary, transportation, health care, I'm not so sure a bunch of software engineers are going to solve that problem for you. In other words, we are trying and struggling with good faith to address some really tricky problems. And we do that in such a way that I, well, we're, 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 we're doing the hard work of figuring out how exactly to go about this, including the purpose here. How do we make the most of this WHO report? Um, many of you know uh, that the ethics community in the IT or the informatics community is, have been collaborating for a very, very long time on this. As a matter of fact, there were problems with racism in databases 50 years ago. It was, why was it okay then? It's a pregnant, awkward pause. Uh, we have known for years that there are problems with decision support systems that render diagnoses in clinical contexts or with prognostic scoring systems that predict an ICU whether and when you're going to die. The ethics literature on this is large. Can anybody here tell me what's different about AI? Except maybe it's a little better and has an, an, an a, little, uh, a little shinier than some of the other things were. But as a matter of fact, the challenges we face now and the challenges the WHO faced were of long standing. And I think that's good and, and interesting. Uh, one of the things that we lurch in all of these contexts toward is standards. Um, the informatics community has known, there's a great saying in the informatics community where someone will proclaim, I love standards. I'm glad there are so many of them. Uh, if you have a look at, uh, I think it's, I wrote it down here, page 35 of the WHO report is a chart that shows a survey of standards for ethics and AI. There are quite literally scores of them. Uh, what we wanted to do, I think, was not add one more, but to provide a kind of synthesis, you know, a meta-analysis, if you will, of all of the work that our communities have gotten very suddenly very interested in. Namely, what ought to be the principles that guide that guide us? What ought to be the standards for safety and access and fairness? How ought we to ensure that evaluation, an issue in the informatics community uh, since people started tinkering with computers in hospitals, that's been well known. Um, it's, it's been something we don't always adopt. I mean, how many of your hospitals uh, did a real thorough evaluation before and after you implemented your electronic health record? Speaking of which, I had it here on my phone a minute ago. I was looking at an electronic health record. Uh, how many of you all who, oh, I, I have to log in again, you see. How, I, I'm not going to hold it up because there might be a patient record on it. How many of you who work in hospitals and write notes and charts have used an AI system lately? Now, now, Dr. Winnie, was that for scheduling or was that for diagnosis? <laughs> uh, what is interesting for our purposes is to be clear about the very many uses that information technology can be brought to bear in healthcare settings. Uh, one of them is, of course, the, 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 the well, scheduling would be great if it could help us reduce disparities and improve access. Uh, or both. When you so Matt, when you when you when you use it, I mean, do you use a diagnostic program uh, to to help you? Because most of our colleagues do not. And that's a function, by the way, of your particular implementation. Yeah, it's it's probably a function in my specific role. But we, I mean, we do have AI that helps with scheduling. Uh, we also have AI that helps with, uh, you know, that sends out alerts essentially within the EMR. Right. Remind uh, just just to remind you about reminders. Reminders and alerts have been like little AI systems, except they weren't AI for a very long time. If Dr. Winnie were to prescribe a drug for me and, and somebody had elsewhere moved, changed kilograms to pounds or something or other, a good system is going to say, are you sure you want that dose for Ken? Uh, these have been, anybody's wandered by a trauma center in ICU knows that bells and alarms and whistles are going off all the time. It's produced, by the way, a phenomenon called alarm fatigue, right? Um, we've gotten really used to turning them off. The implementation, oh, I, I tremble at the use of that word, but efforts to actually start using these systems in healthcare settings for clinical care, 
for public health and for research, it remains in its infancy in the context of artificial intelligence programming, but is really getting long in the tooth in terms of the kinds of informatics tools that have been around for generations. And I think they provide a very good platform one, we're thinking about the WHO report and thinking about best next steps for it, but also, too, for our institutions, our organizations, our corporations to be thinking a little more clearly about what it is we're getting when we get one of these. There are great questions around this. In fact, the ethics and informatics community have done a great job in a very short time identifying a whole lot of issues or re-identifying a whole lot of issues, including governance, including accountability, emphasizing privacy, making sure that we're transparent and accountable, and so forth. But while we're busy doing that, I found a wonderful quote here. I'm going to try and get it in the chat. Yes, there it is. Uh, there are great questions about our colleagues who practice nursing and medicine using these tools, and great questions about how much of their, their design they need to know. How much software engineering do you need to know to be able reliably to use a diagnostic expert system? Uh, what are the phenomena surrounding that? And so forth. I think it's a really exciting opportunity and one that points to, for example, some suggestions made by a number of our colleagues uh, in the context of evaluation or assessment. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, has, has uh, in fact, uh, I'm not going to attempt to spell it, but, but use your favorite search engine uh, and look for the term algorithmovigilance. In other words, there's a lot of thought around how it is we want to be able to govern, making clear that governance does not always require government, but in some cases it surely does. How we split those up and how we get the, the kind of metabolization of the report that I think the, our colleagues at the WHO um, intended, I think is really quite important. And it's an opportunity for the intersection of the ethics, the bioethics and informatics communities to continue to support. Um, Craig, I think you made a very interesting point about uh, kind of decentralization here. We keep selling products to people, telling them how good it's going to be for them. Uh, imagine some sort of analog for citizen science where all of these databases to which my information has been contributed are available to me to query. Um, one of the things we learned in public health is if you insisted on consent forms every time a reputable government tried to do a surveillance for a communicable disease, public health would shut down by tea time today. Uh, in a community in which we trust our healthcare professionals, we give up our information all the time. And frankly, one might say after a point, why are you not using the latest software to protect me? Remember, the point of, of, of wedding ethics and informatics is not to say, stop, slow down, don't do that, although sometimes maybe we need to do that. It might be to say, here's how. And there will be a day, and the lawyers in the room will appreciate this point, when the lawsuits are not, why did you use a, a bulky computer and get the wrong answer? It's, why did you not use a good computer and get the right answer? We're at a moment now that I think is really quite exciting uh, in the evolution of these technologies. It's a moment that is shaped by great science, by software engineers who are doing extraordinarily creative work. So, uh, parentheses, uh, the software engineering community has been doing a great job for a long time, uh, for a very long time um, in ethics. A shout out to uh, Alex London, by the way, uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon, where I once had a happy job in, in an AI lab, uh, who also contributed to the uh, WHO report. Sorry if I wasn't supposed to mention that name, but uh, in terms of the shout out, but it is a sort of acknowledgement that's worth mentioning. That we have got this, I think, that is the, the, the intersection of the ethics and informatics communities to take documents like the WHO report and start saying, here's how we're going to make sure that we, had, we, 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 we get Wendell's point about not one more shiny object for people uh, who are privileged enough to enjoy it, but to use it for the benefit of global health. And we're gonna start under the hood, if you will, with the designers who are actually writing the programs and the people who are maintaining databases and collecting information for them. We've known our databases are balky, corrupt, and biased for a long time. We're gonna give ourselves traumatic brain injury if we keep slapping our foreheads over it as if it were a new discovery. 
it's time to fix that. It might be that federated learning is the way to do. It might be the way synthetic data opportunity and so forth. Uh, but the positive concluding point is we have a moment now shaped by this initiative, uh, shaped by our North American Center for Ethics and Health Information Technology and collaborations that have sprung up everywhere to bring people of goodwill together to tackle these interesting problems. The WHO document brought people from around the world in a first ever opportunity uh, to, to have a global attempt, your own and, 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 uh, and the rest, did a magnificent job herding such cats, some of which were mutations from other galaxies, to try and figure out how to get our heads, our hearts, our hands, and our software around the extraordinary problem of global health. Uh, and uh, to conclude, as I began, uh, Lisa and Millie, uh, thank you for a very important opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Goodman. Um, I don't see any questions that have not been answered yet through the chat. So if you have a question you would like to ask, please use the chat. Um, Thanks so much. We have time for about, uh, we have time for one question. And thank you also to folks who joined us on, on the live stream. We're going to end that now and we have time for about one question.